young man minding his own business then gets that divine tap on the shoulder preach my word go forth into the highways and the hedges maybe not preach behind the pulpit maybe go into secular go into marketplace go where I send you go how I tell you imagine hearing that and here you are had plans for your life and here you are, had objectives for your own future. And now, lo and behold, <laughs> God done called you. God done laid his hands on you. Hello, everybody. This is Bishop J. Charles Carrington. Here you are. I am the senior pastor of Light Builders Church. And, and this is Midday Manor. But, you know, I am supposed to be on birthday rest. And uh, and uh, I had the, the wife, Belize, checking me out. So, I got to be obedient, but I got to leave uh, time to minister. And um, so this is going to be on. This is going to play on tomorrow during Midday Manor. But as built, this is generations coexisting and collaborating in ministry. This is part one. And I have two power pack guests that are going to help us start this off with a bang. Beloved. I want you to share. I want us to get our numbers up. I want you to get somebody who is young in ministry, get somebody who is older in ministry, because we're going to be talking how the devil has come against the older generation and almost made it like it versus the younger generation. And uh, we're going to have a powerful discussion tonight, and we're going to break some works of the devil. We're going to have the Lord destroy some yokes and remove some burdens. We'll be back right after this. Come on, friend. those that don't know, Fred Hammond did two solo projects before uh, Between Commission and RFC. And uh, this is the first solo project. And Fred is absolutely killing it. And this song is gold. This is Fred Hammond's solo album, the first one he did. And it is telling the story of Fred's culture to ministry. You know, many people forget that the Fred Hammond was called Minister Fred Hammond at one time. And uh, Fred preached the gospel. Fred did the work of the ministry. And um, he's doing it in a different way. He's not necessarily behind the pulpit. Uh, Fred is a tremendous artist. He's a tremendous musician. And um, I'm thankful that tonight we got two young men who are ministers in their own right. 
One is behind the pulpit, and the other one is using the uh, mountain of arts and entertainment to go forth. But yet, they're still both great men of God. I want to introduce these two young men to you all. I know they're off mute. They take their mics off mute, or I got to do it, or somebody got to do it. Amen. Both of you are mute your mics. And I wanted to introduce to you that as minister, I don't know if it's pastor now, but minister, Joshua Williams, Pastor Joshua Williams. Joshua hey, Williams. Minister. <laughs> hey, <laughs> now, yes. Tell yes. the peoples who you is. Yeah. Hey, guys. Uh, Josh Williams. Yes, I am a minister. Um, I'm a filmmaker, creative musician. Um, I'm also a business owner. I work on doing video content for businesses. I work in the music department at my church, uh, helping to lead our uh, music team, our musicians. And um, also I preach as well, minister, uh, you know, once or twice a year or as engagements come and just sharing the gospel with people, man, through um, kind of what you were saying through arts and entertainment and also through, hey, Angela, uh, and also through, um, you know, the word of God, I'm really passionate about sharing it with youth, sharing it with older people, using marketplace ministry, talking to people, even in business contexts about Jesus, praying for people, you know, all that. So, yeah, that's that's me. Now, Joshua, you're not just out there by yourself. You, you happen to be um, a part of a tremendous ministry down in the Hampton Roads area. Um, yes, who's, your who's your uh, pastor, son? Who you yeah. want <laughs> Bishop Carl J. Van Sr., uh, New Life Worship Center in Norfolk, Virginia. Yes, sir. That's what Your I'm pastor about. is a good friend of mine. We're both um, part of AIM, um, our, our mutual man of God as Apostle Ira Van Hilliard. Yes, and uh, I thank God for your man and, and woman of God. They are true blue to the core. And um, I, I am thankful that, you know, he allowed you to come on today. He wasn't afraid you know of me it wasn't intimidated and i'm trying to bring you up to baltimore or something you know <laughs> so I, I just want to thank god for bishop van he is a humble man but a powerful man and uh yes, sir. i Indeed. thank god for his ministry who else do we have on here looking like me i think i look a little better but he looks like me <laughs> <laughs> okay cool i thought you introduced me i'm gonna do <laughs> Hello, uh, my name is Evan Carrington. I am the individual that looks like uh, J. Charles Carrington. I'm his son. <laughs> I am an actor, uh, writer, filmmaker in my own right as well. Um, I also serve in multiple different capacities as any good PK does in his father's ministry. <laughs> and I've been doing so for almost 30 years now. Um, <laughs> Served in youth ministry. I currently serve in the media ministry. I've done security. I've ushered. I've greeted. I've done just about everything. Hey, baby, good to see you. Um, yes. So I do it all, and I'm proud of it. I'm thankful for it. I wouldn't have it any other way. Happy to serve. Love the Lord. Um, I'm, I, I I do it all basically. Um, but no, I am not a minister per se. Um, I have played the minister on screen before and on stage. <laughs> Um, I'm happy to be able to take my faith with me wherever I go, whether it be on stage or on screen or wherever God leads me. I praise God for you, Evan. You are my uh, youngest son. I have two wonderful sons. Both of them are gifted in the arts. And um, my oldest son is uh, illustrative art. And, uh, Evan is more of the um, demonstrative art, if I could say that. And uh, Joshua is Evan's friend, so I guess he's a quasi son to me. Uh, he spent time with us, and we love him and looking forward to just some powerful works. I want to ask all of you on there right now that on Facebook Live, share this. Share this. Um, it's going to be shared on, on all of my venues, and it will be on our page on Johnny Charles Carrington Jr. Um, the page, I, I went back to my government name instead of Bishop J. Charles on this page, you know, to honor my dad. My dad passed away five years ago. And, um, you know, this this past May 26 marked five years to the day. And I said, well, what I would do is honor my dad. And uh, everybody don't know my first name is Johnny. 
So now you do, don't misuse it. But I just want to thank you. <laughs> for, for, um, I am a Johnny Joe H and NY, and I, I am a proud son of a bishop. Um, I am uh, a blessed man of God, my wife, Althea, and our sons, our family, a uh, wonderful daughter uh, in love, and um, uh, we don't have in-laws in this household. And then you see um, just the blessing of the Lord that comes on us. And there's people here. My wife is uh, commenting. This young lady named Angela Faith. I wonder who she is, but we'll talk about her another time. But she's a wonderful <laughs> person. I love her so much. And I'm just asking all of you all that are on with us today, near and far, to share, share uh, this wonderful time. All right, guys, y'all ready? Buckle your seatbelts, and uh, we're going to hit you hard. We're going to hit you hard. The reason why we're on here tonight is because I wanted to say how the enemy is seeking to bring a divide between the older generation of ministry and the newer generation. He's seeking to exacerbate generational differences. He's seeking to cause us not to work together, to th be threatened by each other. You don't know. I've been in ministry, and just to tell my story, I was called to preach at 12, 12 years old. And um, I uh, was preaching on the streets with a good friend of mine. He may be looking at some point tonight. And uh, he and I, and I'm going to mention some names. Um, there was an older gentleman, uh, Josh Nevin, uh, that uh, had confidence in me as a young minister. You know, when I was called back in the day, um, you know, we told our pastors we were called. So he would say, all right, my name preach. So back in the day, they had what they called trial sermons. And we yep. were truly put on trial. <laughs> and uh, if you could preach, you, would, you were summarily told. <laughs> <laughs> and if you were given five minutes at what they used to call platform service, you go over that five minutes in the back, your collar would be moving up and down. Somebody might be pulling your shirt, you know. And, uh, you know, you just had to bring it. You had five minutes to bring it. And if you couldn't bring it in five minutes, you didn't have it. And I grew up in that environment. And, um, you know, thankfully, my man of God, uh, he's uh, my, my, my pastor, my father, who gave me my beginning in the ministry. Uh, he's Chief Apostle Monroe Randolph Saunders Sr. Many people know him nationally in the Baltimore area, uh, especially, but especially around the world. He was well-respected, world-renowned. And, and just to tell you a funny story, when I got called to preach, I went to him so zealous, so zealous. And I went to him and he was talking to other bishops and I interrupted him in the middle of his conversation with other bishops during our convocation. And Bishop Silas uh, uh, nicely, but sternly told me, boy, get over there. God ain't call you, keep quiet. Don't you see him talking. And that's the only time I remember him being harsh with somebody and I already leave the church. I, I mean, where was I going? 12, 13 years old. <laughs> you know, my parents were there. My father was a deacon in the church. My mother sat in the choir. Both my parents taught Sunday school. But I had that zeal and I just had to tell my pastor. So the Lord told me to sit down, keep quiet and serve him. And six months later, I came back to him, made an appointment, came to him the right way. He didn't interrupt him. And he said, Charlie, well, he used to call me Sonny Boy. He said, Sonny Boy, I knew you were called to preach. I just wanted to sit down and talk to you and thank you for repenting of being so rude. And I did. <laughs> we sat down to talk. He gave me my date for my, my trial sermon. Yeah. And um, I've been running ever since. So I was licensed at 14. I used to preach on the streets with Dr. Lewis Logan. He's uh, in the Atlanta area now pastor in the AME church, lifelong friend. And also uh, there was a gentleman who believed in me and I'll never forget uh, Elder Eddie Morgan. Eddie Morgan is well in his nineties now. And uh, Eddie Morgan was like Wimpy on uh, McDonald's. He loved McDonald's. He loved McDonald's cheeseburgers. I think he still eats McDonald's cheeseburgers when his family lets him. But I owe a debt of gratitude to Eddie Morgan. He used to let me use his bullhorn. And he had a very nice bullhorn. And we'd be on the streets of Baltimore, down in Lafayette Plaza, downtown Baltimore, preaching. Used to be a Woolworths down there, Rite Aid, when they first started. And that's when they had counters down there. And I get my grilled cheese and tomato soup. 
And I have to be pre sales my reward a Coke, grilled cheese, and tomato soup. <laughs> and those in those days, they had counters. And I never forget that 14 year old. Uh, 13 year old young man preaching the gospel, Eddie Morgan's war woman. And I uh, just, my life has not been the same. So, you know, we all got that uh, pedigree. I wanted to say, though, as we get ready to jump into it, gentlemen, I, I'm going to kind of not spare because there's just this spirit that's, again, pervasive in the body of Christ today. And I'm not going to do all the talking, but I got to just set this up where some young men. Um, don't want to sit under anybody. Some older men want to hold on to it till they die, and then there's nothing to turn over. I want to mention a phrase. Let's 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 start off this time together. Unbridled, unbridled, and now I'm gonna mention this phrase. Unbridled ambition. I want you both to take a minute and think about it and give me your best biblical example of unbridled ambition and why you think that. It doesn't matter because I know y'all haven't had time to collaborate, but neither one of you knew what I was going to say. But if you come up with the same person, that's fine. But give me, I'm starting with you, Joshua, since you're not my blood son. I don't want you to feel bad, you know. I, <laughs> I want you to think about unbridled ambition. Give me a biblical character and why. You named that person. Mm. Okay, put me on the spot. Uh, I actually uh, had preached a sermon um, about maybe a year and a half ago called Platforms, Positions, and Power. And um, mm. I talk a lot in that sermon. You got the notes? About, huh? You got the notes? Yeah, I pulled up the notes now. <laughs> um, oh, that sounds like coming to me to be remixed. Yeah, yeah. Um, in that in that sermon, you know, I talked about how if we allow our pursuit of a platform, um, you know, being, you know, having our name out there, you know, having influence, um, an, an opportunity to communicate ideas or having a position, you know, a social rank or official title, everybody's trying to race to be the next prophet, a bishop, a bishop or apostle, we're all trying to grab titles or power in the sense of, you know, uh, influence over people, uh, you know, people may not have the title or may not have that authority, but they want to have, they want to say something. And so um, I noticed there, there was a, you know, a dangerous trend um, in, in all generations, really, that I've observed um, of people leaning towards those, those three things. Um, and, and one example I gave was, um, the story of Simon the sorcerer, um, <laughs> how he, he um, you know, was a sorcerer and he got saved under Paul's ministry. And um, after that, he wanted to kind of buy that same power because he saw Paul, you know, going about, you know, casting out devils and, and healing and all this stuff. And Simon's like, yo, can, can, can you, if I pay you, can you show me how to do that? And he was, and, you know, Paul rebuked him for that. And I feel like, uh, a lot of times that ambition, um, that um, desire to to have the power of God without spending the time in the Word, spending that time developing, and trying to jump steps and, and, and have a platform immediately is some dangerous, unchecked ambition. I love that one because, you know, Simon actually did get saved. And, and I think when you read that text, you got to read those words. He actually accepted Christ. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that just goes to show you, you can accept Christ and still have these issues. Yeah. And, um, and Simon was a prime example. Man, that's a great example. You got seasoning on you, sir. There's a, there's a seasoning. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Evan, what about you, sir? What about you? An example of unbridled ambition and and who and why you use that person. No, it's funny because, you know, thinking about that, I remember a conversation that we had last night um, with a person who may or may not have commented on this post. I was pretty timely for this. Um, this isn't exactly a biblical example, but I'm going to tie it in. Well, to start off, it's not, but I'm going to tie it in. Um, so we were watching something that was related to Dr. King, Dr. Martin Luther King, and anyone that knows me knows how much I respect uh, Dr. Martin Luther King. 
Um, I think about this one. Um, this is one of the last Sunday sermons he gave, actually. It was called The Drum Major Instinct. Um, and in that speech, he was talking about the dangers of um, putting so much weight behind titles and positioning in the church, particularly when it comes down to preachers. Um, and even just when it comes down to people that they respect or allowed to have platforms, to Josh's point, in the pulpit or some sort of advanced standing, if you will, in the church because of their title or because of their power or financial resources. And Dr. King was saying in that example that the church is the one place where someone who has a title should forget the fact that they have a title, right? And even just outside of that, you have so many people that come into the church and place a lot of stock in the title, in their rank, or the amount of years that they've been there. Um, this is my seat. This is my ministry. This is my way of doing things I've been doing for a long period of time. Uh, when the Bible says very clearly, humble yourself before the Lord and he will exalt you, right? Mm -hmm. um, so when I think about a biblical example, I think about Paul. Uh, I think about when um, he was Saul at first. And I think about his unbridled ambition, which was used um, in the way that wasn't constructive for the gospel when he was trying to destroy the church. Uh, when he eventually converted, he didn't skip steps. He was brought low. He was blinded. He fell off of his horse and he was forced into a place where he stayed for a period of time where he couldn't really do anything until someone who he tried to persecute came in and God used him um, to pray for Paul at that time. And then Paul was released. Uh, to then go out and be utilized for God's glory. And that's when he became, or Saul became Paul, and he was able to then be this great apostle uh, who was able to convert and preach to most of the modern world at that time. Wow, both, both tremendous examples. Well, let's let's go a little bit deeper. Um, when we speak of bridal ambition, um, the first one came to my mind was uh, Absalom. Um, and, and when he uh, wanted his father's throne so much, and then when David um, had kind of banished Absalom after he killed Amnon after Amnon raped uh, Tamar, that's a whole drama right there. And uh, somebody said the Bible's boring. I beg the difference. <laughs> I mean, hey, you got incest. She got rape of your sister. She wasn't his full sister, but half sister. And Amnon was sick with love, the Bible says. And once he raped her, he discarded her. But Absalom, as you all know, he burned um, Joab's fields to get David's attention. He wanted Joab to tell him. And when David didn't do everything Absalom wanted, then Absalom stood between David and the people and uh, kind of won the people over to his side. As, as young men who are in ministry, what do you feel your place is in terms of the ministry that you serve in? Do you feel you are to heap influence to yourself or do you feel that you are to deflect influence to your pastor? Now, I want you to think about that because sometimes us older pastors seem to lose touch, seem to not necessarily understand the younger generation. And the temptation comes on the younger generation to gravitate towards someone who they perceive can hear them and will listen to them. Talk to me a little bit about that. You, whoever wants to grab it first, go ahead. How do you feel? How do you deal with influence? Yeah, that's an interesting question. Um, and, you know, I noticed like I had did a Facebook post about something. And I noticed that um, people were responding to me, sending me DMs about it. I'm like, man, I do have influence. I need to be careful about that influence. And I think for me, if I'm posting something or if I'm sharing someone, ultimately I'm trying to point back to Christ. Um, I can share an opinion all day, but if there's no weight, um, hey, Ms. Carrington, um, if there's no um, weight of the word of God behind it, it's just noise. And so even in my discussions with people about business or discussions about life, I try to always tie it back into the scripture. So a lot of times it's not even about pointing, at least for me, not pointing back to my church or my pastor. It's more about just pointing back to Christ and pointing back to the word of God. 
Um, obviously, you know, if, if I'm inside of the church and we're having a discussion about something, we probably should go talk to the pastor. I'm like, hey, you, maybe go talk to the pastor about that if that's an issue. Um, you know, so in that context, yes. Um, but if we're talking about life and about uh, lessons, you know, my dad um, was a big influence on me growing up. And so, you know, I could always come to him and have those conversations. And he always pointed me back to the word. You know, that was just how my parents were. They were like, hey, let's let's look at this from a biblical point of view. And so I think in to sum it all up, in in, in my influence, I always want to make sure I'm pointing people back to the word of God rather than me, the person trying to look for the next word for what, what I'm going to say next. But it's like, no, I'm just go read your Bible, bro. Like, that's where I'm getting all this stuff from. <laughs> like that. Like that. Evan? So for me, uh, this question is a little bit loaded, um, <laughs> if I'm being honest. Um, now, ultimately, I mean, we are meant to uh, refer people back to God and deflect back to God with everything that we do. That's what it says in Colossians 3.17. Um, but for me, looking at that specific example, um, I mean, my pastor and my father are the same person, <laughs> essentially, in this situation. So um, for me, I mean, just being someone who wants to be a good reflection, if you will, or a good example of what it means to be a good member or partner in my ministry, my desire would be to ultimately defer back to the pastor who I trust because, you know, our pastor personally will deflect back to God um, at the end of the day. So uh, it's a cop out, but at the same time, it's kind of more of a loaded question from my perspective, because really, if you're a PK, or if you're somebody whose parents do serve in ministry, you want to make sure, obviously, that you're in a position to where they you are representing the church well, uh, but you're also representing the word well, because we're all meant to be in conjunction and in unison. And again, I'm comfortable doing that because of the fact that I know that you serve God at the end of the day, and I know that you seek God. I've listened to you. I can trust that. I can have validation in that. And in my efforts, I hope to defer. Wow. Yeah. The reason why I mention that is because um, that is one major area that a lot of younger ministers fall um, because they start having a measure of influence. Of course, you're not the pastor. Um, your job is not to be the visionary of the church, but a major stumbling block, a major source of influence that you're given. Um, you can have a temptation to take that influence and begin to think people will prefer you above, you know, the visionary. Um, I remember when my, my both my sons, when Jonathan and Evan were younger. And they like to wear my shoes sometimes. And I, I remember when they were at certain ages, um, they would put my shoes on and uh, mock how I would talk to them. Boy, get over there, and, uh, you know. And when they put on my shoes, they tried to assume my place, but the shoes were always too big. And they would try to walk around three years old in a size 12 and wind up falling and tripping. And I remember one time, uh, I'm not going to mention the names, one of my sons had a juice and a plate of uh, of uh, goldfish uh, from uh, Pepperidge Farm fish and uh, had the juice in one hand in a cup, the Pepperidge Farm fish in another hand walking over to a little table they had. And uh, they had on my shoes. And that fish, the goldfish uh, crackers and the juice was so precious. They had a nice smile on their face that they were looking forward to it. But walking in my shoes, they stumbled, tripped, and the goldfish and the juice both hit the floor. And I just kind of laughed. I, I couldn't get mad, but I just took it as an example how sometimes when we're given uh, opportunities to, quote unquote, put on the, the responsibility um, that we don't always fit into it and we can wind up spilling and making a mess. But that leads me to my other issue because I had mentioned in the beginning of our time together that you have some ministers that are older that hold on. We're in the body of Christ, there is no retirement. I like how my pastor puts it. Um, 
my pastor said he will never retire, but he will restructure. And I know Bishop Van will say, yeah, you heard it too. We were both there to hear that. He said, um, he quoted a song. Uh, I know both of y'all know it. I'm a soldier in the army of the Lord. If I die, let me die in the army of the Lord, you know. And um, there's no retirement. So you restructure. But one of the things that I think has shown this ugly head is on an older minister's part. We hold on out of intimidation. We hold on because we are convinced nobody can do it like us, but us, until there's nothing left of the ministry. We grip the life out of it. And then we try to turn it over to somebody to breathe breath into it. And uh, then we take it back once it has a heart rate again. <laughs> So um, one of the things I, I wanted to get now, so y'all, let's go a little bit deeper. And I'm touching on things as I go, because I'm kind of building you guys up a little bit. Give me a chance to catch your breath. Um, what is your perfect scenario of how older ministry and younger ministry should get along? Evan, I'm going to start with you with this one. It can be biblical. Um, of course, we always want the biblical. But give me an example of your view of what a perfect scenario is or perfect uh, example of how older ministry and younger ministry work together. Intentionality, communication, and discipleship. All three of those uh, things must work hand in hand in concert with each other. Uh, when it comes down to bridging the gap between the, uh, the generations and the older generation work with the younger generation. Um, it just has to work hand in hand um, and hand because they're three things. Um, it has to be genuine. It has to come from a genuine place. Um, and it can't come from a place of fear or intimidation or just like, OK, like, you know, I'm getting phased out. I'm getting aged out of the ministry. Um, this next generation is coming up. I don't know how to deal with them. I just don't know. I mean. You'll know if you communicate, if you take the time to have people in your ear that you can trust and not be afraid of, that you're just asking questions to. If you just say, hey, like, I may not understand how this generation feels about this, get a focus group together, get people who are in ministry you can trust, you can, you can communicate with. Um, but also, I'm really big on succession, the principle of succession. Um, I have expertise in that. So for me, um, if I'm in a season where I find myself transitioning out of something, transitioning out of something, I want to get people together uh, who I trust, but who I know who are passionate about this particular field. And I want to try to delve into their insight. I want to try to prepare them for what they can experience while I'm getting ready to leave. Um, so intentionality, discipleship and communication. Communication is important. Discipleship is important, and you have to be intentional at the same time. Yeah, yeah, I agree. And to tag on to that, I would say one. Um, I'm, I'm gonna say a couple of things. But one thing is relationship. Um, yep. There, the older generation and the younger generation has to be very intentional about knowing people. Um, I feel like there's a lot of um, disconnect because there's not a relationship outside of church on Sunday with certain people. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. Um, I think if you really got to, and this goes again, this goes both ways, older and younger, you really get to sit down, fellowship with people, have lunch, have dinner, have conversations outside of church. Um, you will really get to understand someone and where their heart is truly at towards ministry. Conversations and, outside of church exist, Josh. I never knew, man. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, yeah. Relationship. When you really get to know people, you'll know where their heart is truly at. Like, you know, me and my mom or me and my dad, because my, my dad's a pastor, associate pastor, and my mom's uh, elder and preaches as well, um, family preachers. And so, like, if if I didn't have that relationship with my dad or my mom and they know I may do things differently than them but it's the same goal. It's the same mission. It's just, I'm from a different generation, just as you were from a different different generation from your parents and their parents before them. It's just the same, it's the same thing, nothing new under the sun. Um, 
And so when you have that relationship and know where people's hearts are truly at, that can help with you trusting them more. Um, and also, I think one thing people kind of jump to the extreme, like if you're giving someone a leadership position, they still will have accountability. Like there still yep. will be accountability in place to the lead pastor or someone, an advisory board. Um, there can still be accountability in place and, and because any healthy organization, there's checks and balances. Um, so I think not being afraid of putting someone in a leadership position that may be younger if you see the hand of the Lord on their life, but also realizing there can still be accountability and checks and balances in place for that individual to not run off the rails in a sense of getting into heretical things. Um, and another thing I think is recognizing that the church of today is the church of tomorrow in a sense of, or the church of today is really the church of today, like the, the youth that are in your church. Um, like they are the church of today. Like if those people walk out of the church, the church will die out because, you know, it'll just be continued to be run by 60, 70, 80 year olds. And eventually, you know, as time passes on, there won't be a new generation that's coming up to, to lead them. And so I think, um, recognizing, building those relationships early on, um, having accountability in place and recognizing that there are people that God called Samuel when he was a child. He did. He spoke to him as a child um, and called him into ministry. And he had to go learn under Eli, even though Eli was tripping. Um, but recognizing that God, if God did that thousands of years ago, you better believe God is still calling kids today and they need to be trained, they need to be taught. Um, and also when the time comes, they need to be given that position and authority of whatever the Lord's leading to. So um, it starts with relationships for me. That's where I think the conflict often comes because you have the meeting of ambition, not always unbridled. And ambition is not a bad thing at all. But then you have the intimidation. Um, I'm 61. I just turned 61 with my young looking self on yesterday, on, on yeah. yesterday. Um, I can't, let me tell you a real funny story. I um, was planning to pick up a football game a few years ago. I used to be a linebacker and um, used to be a very good football player. But planning that pick up football game, somebody threw a pass and I thought I was that 20 year old Charlie Carrington that would jump, tip it to myself, and take it to the house the other way. I saw myself jumping. I saw myself tipping the ball. And I saw myself pulling it in and running the other way. When I went to jump, the jump wasn't as high as I thought. When I went to jump, the leg wouldn't communicate <laughs> with me. Or cooperate, I should say. Oh no. I arrived to that place where the 57 or 55 year old remember what I used to do. And when I went to do what I used to do, it ain't that I'm an old geezer just out of shape. But you know, the older you get, there changes. I, I want to ask you all a question, and I know that you all are both younger men. Why do you think older ministers get intimidated with that example I just gave you? What is it in your heart? Both of you have been in ministry a good part of your lives and come from ministry families. What in your heart is the issue why an anointed younger minister intimidates an older minister? I think um, we're all scared of change in a, in a way. Um, I know for me, even as a, as a 29 year old, um, when I see a change in season, um, I may not want to change. And it can be, I think, difficult to know and recognize that, you know, maybe my season in this capacity is coming, you know, to a, um, you know, a close or it's, you know, I need to wind down a little bit more. Um, I think change is, is always something that um, can intimidate us and can cause us to think irrationally rather than just trusting that the one who is leading us and guiding us 
is leading us to the right place and that we're in the right place. Um, on the intimidation factor from young ministers, um, I really, I really don't know. I think sometimes we have to watch um, jealousy, um, you know, even as older people, like, because we're still in the world, we're still being combated by the flesh and got to put it down. And maybe uh, some people haven't been in a position where jealousy has come up in this way. And so we have to check it. I know um, I never thought I was really a jealous person when I saw someone doing something and I started to be like, well, I could do that too. And blah, blah, blah. And, um, so, you know, we just gotta, you gotta check it. It could be jealousy and pride that may be trying to pop up as well that we gotta, you know, gotta watch out for. So, yeah, hey, man. I just want to work in concert with that because that's a really well words. Sorry, those are really good points, Josh. Um, I was thinking pride too, uh, pride on looking at the older ministers part by saying, you know, just I've been doing this a long time, I've packed pulpits. I've had a uh, head knowledge of the word uh, for a long period of time. What can a young person tell me? Pride probably on the younger minister's part to say, hey, well, you know, I'm, I'm young, I'm vibrant, I got a nice following. People are telling me I can do this. Uh, so maybe they can get ahead of themselves in some way, shape or form. But I feel like the heart of it all is maybe a fear of being obsolete. And that can particularly come from the older minister's perspective because you're right. Josh, you had a good point when we were talking about just like time passing so on by just, you know, being in a season where you can kind of feel like your time may be running out and um, the process of uh, that fear of being obsolete or becoming obsolete could be speeding up with the uh, arrival and the promotion of these new ministers that are coming up in our generation right now. Uh, that could be speeding up the uh, erasure, if you will of um, the older population and what they can deem to be their relevancy, their influence, their title, their power, and their positions. Um, and that can be a scary thing uh, to lose all of that um, if you're you know, coming at it with a huge ego. But I feel like in some way, shape, or form, um, there's that basic human desire to just you know, kind of wonder what will happen in the future. Could we be replaced by certain things and certain technologies? Even if we look at, at looking at it in this sense, could we be replaced uh, by a younger generation that could have more influence than we did, that could have a bigger impact uh, than we had? Um, I feel like that may be going on or that thought process may be going on in a lot of um, pastors' minds. I, I brought that up because I remember my experience. Um, I've been in the ministry now for 47 years of my life. Yeah, uh, 47 years of my life have been dedicated to the gospel of Jesus Christ, preaching it, singing it, doing whatever I, I can do. And there are times where as an older man, I fight obsolescence. Um, there are times I fight even hearing some younger people say, I would never come to your church. Or if you're over 40, you can't effectively pastor anybody in that age demographic because you're too old and i'm hearing that more often now um not necessarily regarding me i mean i've been complimented bishop you're cool i ain't talking about you you know you're one of the most progressive old guys i know <laughs> you know uh, i'm being told i'm an og but i'm progressive as an og i don't mind the title of og but make sure it's progressive in front of it. But it's it's something that's being said a lot nowadays by younger people that I can't identify or an older minister can't identify with what I need in my life. Therefore, if they come across as uh, over 40, I wouldn't follow them. What would you say to that? in this generation if you hear someone say that um these are hard questions y'all okay i see the sweat beating on your forehead. no i i just have kind of a strong <laughs> opinion of what you just said um the gospel of jesus christ is for the jew the gentile the slave the free the young the old um if Christ is preached, that is the most important thing. Now the presentation may be different and people may have preferences, 
But if you're telling me you can't receive from someone that's over the age of 50 that's preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ, maybe you don't like the gospel. Maybe you just like a light show and loud music um, and an inspirational quote and really don't like the gospel, to be honest with you. Because, um, again, if someone is preaching Christ and um, that person is in line with what the Holy Spirit is saying for the day, you're going to see the difference whether that person was 16 25, 30, 45, 60, or 85. It doesn't matter when, when that preacher is in line with the Holy Spirit and the right people are there. Uh, the power of God is going to be felt. Now, I can see how there may be some pastors out there that may hold on to a certain way of doing things in, in, in regards to a church service format and and can kind of look down upon other types of formats and i can understand the frustration from a young person in that sense when uh you know a leader or a pastor may basically talk down upon other format church formats that are not heretical um that can be frustrating and i think that is um, unfair to other churches unfair to other leaders especially again when it's not heretical and um, the, the gospel is being preached in a powerful way. Um, so, yeah, I would say um, be quick to listen, slow to speak, um, be humble, be kind. Um, you can learn from anybody. You can yeah. learn from a five-year-old. <laughs> I mean, seriously, like hey, God yeah. can use who God used a donkey to speak. <laughs> like it don't matter. Um, and I think it's just. If you're coming in it with that mindset of, oh, I can't receive from someone, that's a dangerous place to be because God can use whatever source. Um, so I think being less concerned on how old the person is, more concerned with, does that person flow into the Holy Spirit? Is that Amen. person um, allowing God to speak through them, whatever the Lord wants to say? Because I feel like some preachers may just stick to a script and do the same messages every year without seeking the Lord and just doing what they do versus God told me to speak on this today. That's what I'm going to speak on. Yeah. Um, I feel like that's what you be, should be concerned with rather than the age of the person. Wow. Look, Noah was 500 uh, when he built the ark. <laughs> Abraham was 75 years old when God called him out of Canaan. Jacob had however many kids he had. <laughs> <laughs> before Joseph came around. Um, you know, the list goes on and on and on uh, in regards to just how people were using the Bible. Paul was used well into old age. Peter was used well into old age. John wrote the back. John, the, yeah. Yeah, the Apostle John wrote the back half of the New Testament uh, when he was 100 years old in exile on, Saint, on Patmos. God can use anyone at any given point in time it doesn't matter how old you are it doesn't matter how young you are to limit what god can do because that's what you're doing you're limiting what god can do by limiting yourself to who you're listening to okay because to your point josh i agree like sometimes it may be daunting if you may be listening to a familiar flow and if you have, may have questions about that but at the same time you can't limit the well that you're drinking from as long as from a godly well, that's the most important thing. You have to, if you draw, make sure you draw from a well that's sustainable for you because you can't feed yourself with everything. You can't, you can't feed yourself with every doctrine that's out there, but that goes beyond the scope of age. Uh, you right. have to make sure that you're seeking the discernment, you're seeking the Holy Spirit in regards to what you're drawing from, when you're drawing from something. But at the same time, you're coming at either from a place of pride if age is your main factor, yeah. because at the end of the day, I mean, God could use you're married and you have a five year old son to your point. That five year old son or daughter could be speaking to you somehow. God could be using them somehow. Are you saying because of the fact that they're a certain age that they, can, that they can't be used? I mean, really, that's just my point. You can't if you're limiting the scope based off of age, you are also limiting God. Look, I, I love both of your answers because that's how the enemy exacerbates the divide, you know. Um, yeah, I realize, like, I used to tease our young adults 
in the church because the slang would change. Like one Sunday I got up, was messing with them. And I said something like, man, that's hizzle for shizzle or something silly like that. And they all cracked up. Evan and Jonathan put their head down, shaking their head. I think I embarrassed them. No, no, no. We, we cringed. We didn't crack up. We cringed. <laughs> <laughs> that's what we did. Cringe. And, 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 and uh, the thing I laughed at, our youth director, she's uh, just turned uh, 35 or will be 35. And she came to me a little while ago and admitted, she said, uh, uh, Bishop, I can't keep up no more either. <laughs> I was thinking, oh, I got help now, you know, because the slang changes so much. I was teaching my niece once, or one of my nieces, and she said, Daddy, you know, how did they put the yell on part of it? And uh, and I, I looked at her and said, hmm. And then she looked at me like I caught her saying something because I would make fun of some of the young ladies and get her, stop, you know, and I would just, Get up and tease them about that. They're like, all right, I gotta change because you don't heard me say it, you know. And it was just funny. But I, I bring that up because the man our time is gone already almost. I bring that up because then it, it, it's when we pattern ministry after the world, the age and generational differences will become the focus and not ministry, like you both said. And that's what I'm concerned about. I know we can't solve it all in one setting, and this is the, the first of several conversations. But before we close, I, I want to ask you both, now take time to think about this. If you had 5,000, 10,000 people, in a venue right now that you were talking to about this very subject. And you notice the young people sat on the left, the 35, 40 and under sat on the left, and the 40, 40, 40 plus, <laughs> the great generation sat on the right. And we had the natural divide going on because we both sitting in there not trusting each other, mad at each other, angry with each other. I want y'all to take a minute and give me a word of healing as if you were before 10,000 divided evenly of how we can bring the generations together for ministry. Yeah. Uh, I guess you're ready. You got two uh, more. <laughs> all right. Um, first, I would say, you know, Ephesians chapter four, verse three, make every effort to keep yourselves united in the spirit binding yourselves together with peace for there is one body and one spirit just as you've been called to one glorious hope for the future um we have one mission this is one faith one baptism we are on the same mission to spread the gospel of jesus christ the world is already trying to divide us the world is already trying to tear us down we're already getting beat up at work. We're already, some of us getting beat up at home. We don't need to divide when we are supposed to come together and be united. And so we need the wisdom of the older generation. We need the feet and the tenacity of the young generation. And we, when we bring those two things together, we can be unstoppable for the kingdom. We bring the tech savvy. We bring the biblical knowledge over here. We bring the, the passion and the fire and the fervor and we bring the power of the holy spirit bringing those things together which each generation has um a different portion and a different measure and when we combine that together we, we can cook something good <laughs> for the kingdom of god and so um i think it's more it, it, now more than ever it's important for us to to know one another to be united on one front um, because we can go further together when we are united, just as Christ has called us to do. Christ has called us to be at peace with one another because a house divided cannot stand. So if we are divided in, in our own congregations, us versus them, um, the who's and the what's and, and, and the old versus the, the, the new, 
we cannot stand against the power of the enemy. But when we come together and unite as one body, one faith, um, one people called of God, each doing their own function, every part of the body has a function. And if we come together, we can do some things and tear apart the kingdom of darkness. Love it. Evan? Oh, you got the mess right there. He already said everything. Uh, <laughs> I was going to use a passage from the New Testament, but that was basically similar. So I'm just going to leave you guys with this one verse. And give my son Solomon the wholehearted devotion to keep your commands, statutes, and decrees, and to do everything to build a palatial structure for which I have provided. That was David's last prayer before the assembly of uh, his people, and he commissioned Solomon. And guess what Solomon did right when he went and assumed his position as king? He went and he prayed for wisdom and he prayed for wisdom because David put that foundation of prayer and seeking God and going to God into Solomon. We need each other to Josh's point. We need the wisdom of the older generation. We need the um, investment of the older generation to put the battery inside of us. And they need us to carry forth that mission so they will see it through the completion. Um, so we need that. We need each other. We can't do life without each other. We are one body. This is uh, Hezekiah Walker said, I need you. You need me. We're all part of God's body, yeah. basically. So yeah, I mean, it's just, we can't put ourselves in this position where we're being so influenced by the world, so influenced by the division, so influenced by these barriers, so influenced by these generational gaps and divides. You have Generation X, Generation Y, Millennials. You have the Zoomers. That's cool. But guess what happens when we all work together? Powerful things happen because we have so many generations of knowledge and influence utilizing the Holy Spirit that we can draw from to be effective for God's kingdom. We can't lose sight of what the goal is. And the goal is to bring God's kingdom here on this earth, to be utilized on this earth for his glory. Again, I'm not a minister, so my goal isn't to preach in this scenario, but hopefully this touches somebody. At the end of the day, just even in this call that you have this in right now, I mean, me and Josh from the same generation, I mean, he's four days older than me, uh, but even still. So we're here. You're the one that's giving us this platform and you're inspiring us to go forth and to lead the charge to influence uh, God's people. And that's what we'll do. But it takes that concerted effort to be able to work together in tandem so we can be effective for the kingdom. My mind goes over as we come to a close. Um, in this time together and these two young men, if the body of Christ is in their hands, I am fully happy. Young men like these two, I am thoroughly confident. But as I close, my mind goes to when Moses sat on the top of the mountain and his arms were getting hit. And uh, as long as his arms were up, the victory was won over the Amalekites. Moses' arms got too heavy and he had to rest them. And the Amalekites began to win. I pray that we recognize the need for Aaron and Hur again. And I think Aaron and Hur is not just two old guys with a long beard. Aaron and Hur can be an old guy on one arm and a young guy on the other. And I think as long as Moses' arms are held up, I think that's what we really want. I'm very proud of you both. I appreciate you both. Thank I'm you. very, again, thankful for your time. And um, I just want to tell you both, I am extremely proud of you both. And uh, I hold back the tears because I can be emotional, but I'm very proud to see that the body of Christ with young men like you, young people like you, is in good hands. I'm going to close this out now, and I want to thank everybody that tuned in. This is uh, Midday Manor in a different matter, in a different manner. And um, I just want to thank you all for tuning in. I'm going to leave this up. It's going to be there. I'm on break uh, for a little bit, uh, birthday week, you know. And uh, I'm just going to take this little couple of days to uh, recharge. But I want y'all to listen to this and play it back again. It's going to be on YouTube. It's going to be on this Facebook Live. And I think we're in good hands in the body of Christ. Joshua, take your path. I'm proud of you.
Evan, your dad said he's proud of you. We go out with Fred Hammond, same album. Grace, I pray God's grace upon you both. Love you so much. Let's see the old generation and the younger generation group together. <laughs> Love you both, guys. Love you too, sir. Love you too, Doug. I bless y'all.